So across all six of our locations, are there any conspiracy theorists, theorists with us today? Anybody that would consider yourself a conspiracy theorist? My guess is like most of you right now are saying, no, like, man, no. That, that's like those paranoid people, right? Really? Are you sure? Because, see, as I listen to sports talk radio on Monday morning, December 18th, I heard a lot of conspiracy theorists speaking out in this town. Why? Because on Sunday afternoon, this happened at Heinz Field. Does anybody remember this, right? Jesse James, he caught a touchdown pass, which virtually sealed the victory for the Steelers over the evil empire of the New England Patriots, only to have it overturned by video replay. And everyone in this town that next morning was saying that the the, the NFL and the referees and the video replay judges, they all had conspired to assure a Patriots victory. I mean, I think, I think Russia was even involved in it, right? <laughs> What's the general like, definition of a conspiracy theory? It's this here. It's the theory that an event or a phenomenon occurs as a result of a conspiracy between interested parties. More specifically, a belief that some covert influential agency, typically with an oppressive intent, is responsible for an ex- unexplained event. And that sort of describes Steeler Nation on the afternoon of December 15th, right? 17th. That's how we all felt. They were against us. They were out to get us. They all conspired to take that win away from us. I actually Googled what the top 10 conspiracy theories are that are out there of all time. And here's some of that landed in the top 10. Area 51 in Nevada is an alien storage facility that fuels our military technology. JFK was not killed by Lee Harvey Oswald. The Beatles, Paul McCartney secretly died in 1966. (laughs) Reptilian elite secretly run the whole world. I was not aware of that. That is in the top 10. There's a 9-11 cover-up. Perhaps it was a government-planned attack. And then you know what the number one was? The moon landings were fake, right? Can we just take a minute and look at that last one just for a second, all right? You know, the United States first landed on the moon in July of 1969. Here's some actual footage of those early sort of landings, right? You can take a look at those right there. This is the actual footage of these early landings, right? And conspiracy theorists claim that the government used state-of-the-art special effects to create those images in order to fool the whole entire world that we had actually accomplished this. That's their theory, right? They went and we went into some kind of, they set some kind of stage and they faked the whole thing. Interestingly, th- there was a Hollywood blockbuster called Robinson Crusoe Goes to Mars that was released at the same exact time period And it claims to have used all of the -the state-of-the-art capabilities that the Hollywood industry had available to it at the same exact time, right? So so here's a video of the the cutting-edge trailer from that movie at the same exact time. Oh, that's believable. That looks so real. Look at that. I can still see the string on that thing coming down and landing. Wow. I'm not sure who this dude is with no shirt on, but I don't know what's going on there. Look at that. I mean, this is so authentic. It's only one step ahead from present reality, right? I mean, anybody knows that you could see the string on the spaceship as it was landing on Mars? With the technology available in the late 60s, it just seems impossible to me that, that a group of people got together and created a set filmed this, created it, and faked the moon landings. And what seems even like more impossible to me is that those people that did that, that none of them ever broke their silence, right? You know, according to to, to Michael Barkham, he's a conspiracy theory expert. He says that conspiracy theories, they appeal to a lot of people because of this. They came, they claim to to explain what institutional investigation cannot. 
They appeal to us because they seem to make sense out of what is confusing. Conspiracy theories, they divide the world sharply between the forces of light and the forces of darkness, between the unknown bad guys keeping secrets from the innocent, between the brainwashed herds and those that have penetrated the plotter's deception. See, when something unimaginable or unexplainable happens, something that seems almost impossible, many people think it's, it just must be a conspiracy. You know, regardless of how much evidence is produced, there are some people that believe we never landed on the moon. You know, regardless of how much evidence to the contrary, some people believe that we captured aliens in Nevada. I'm pretty sure that Paul McCartney is touring this summer. So, so that must be an imposter though, right? See, many people believe that the NFL commissioner and the referees and the video replay officials all got around and predetermined to conspire against our stillers. Some of you are shaking your head. You're like, you're right, that happened. Like, <laughs> you're still not, still not convinced. You know, some 2,000 years ago, something unimaginable and unexplainable happened. A man named Jesus of Nazareth, he emerged from obscurity, and he began teaching and preaching in the region of Galilee with great authority, as if he was God. It's recorded that at his public baptism, the skies parted, and God spoke over his confirmation of who he was. He railed against the religious elite he denounced oppression of the orphan and the widow and the poor. And he spoke about a God that desired a relationship with you. He made scandalous claims that he was the son of God, the savior of the world. And then he backed up those claims with the miraculous. People were healed of incurable diseases. The blind saw, the deaf heard, the paralyzed got up and walked. And with a single word from his mouth, Raging storms calmed. On several occasions, he made it emphatically clear that he would suffer and that he would die. But on the third day, he would rise again. And I witnessed to, to all of this as a, as a man named Matthew. And he was present when Jesus made a number of those claims about his death and resurrection. And Matthew then watched as Jesus was falsely accused and arrested. He wrote in specific detail about Jesus being dragged out of Jerusalem after being tortured by the Roman guard. And he records this. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of his robe and they put his own clothes on him. And they led him away to crucify him. Matthew actually recorded the name of the man and where he was from that was pulled out of the crowd to carry Jesus' cross up a hill to the place of his execution. He gathered detailed information of the crucifixion of Jesus. He even recorded what people were saying as Jesus hung on a cross dying. He recorded this. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads. He recorded what the religious leaders said at the cross. They, they said this, he saved others. He cannot save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down from that cross. And then we'll believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now. If he desires him, for he said, I'm the son of God. He records who was present at Jesus' death and even gives us the name of the man that took Jesus' dead body off of the cross and had him buried. And then, within days, something unexplainable, unimaginable, and impossible begins to happen. Jesus sightings. Within 40 days of his death, women encounter him at a gravesite. A couple guys have a conversation with him along a road. His disciples, while, while they were hiding and terrified behind locked doors, had an encounter with him. And in one section records over 500 people at one time saw him. Those close to him and those that didn't really know him at all saw him alive. Impossible. So, so, so what do you think happened next back in this time? Conspiracy theories. 
One of them was that the disciples stole the body. Somehow the disciples managed to avoid the Roman guard that was stationed at the tomb, rolled away the stone, unwrapped the body from its strips of burial cloth, then meticulously arranged that burial cloth to have us believe that somehow Jesus rose up out of them. They then carried Jesus off and buried him somewhere else. Another conspiracy theory was that someone impersonated Jesus on the cross. Not sure who would have volunteered for that, but, but the impersonator that some speculate was even Judas, took the beating and died and fooled those at the cross that he was Jesus, even Jesus' mother who was at the cross. Then the real Jesus created fake wounds on his own body and came out of hiding to show himself to his disciples. There was actually a third theory at this time. It was called the swoon theory. And it states that Jesus did go to the cross, but he didn't die. And the cool, damp air in the tomb actually revived him and healed him. And after recuperating for two days, he pushed away the stone. He made his way out and he presented himself to the people. See, conspiracy theories, I think they sometimes just help explain away the unexplainable. That They try to make sense of the impossible. When Jesus was betrayed and arrested and led away, his disciples scattered. We know that Peter followed at a short distance, and we know that the disciple John was actually at the cross on Friday as Jesus died. But we really don't know the whereabouts of the other guys as Jesus dies on Friday and lays in a tomb on Saturday. And then on Sunday, this is recorded. It says, on the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews... On Sunday, the disciples are huddled behind locked doors and they're fearing for their lives. Those that had Jesus executed could very well be looking for them, seeking to imprison them or condemn them to death. And you know what? These disciples throughout the New Testament, Testament they're, they're described as very ordinary men. In one spot, it says that they were unlearned. That they're not special Guys, they're just sort of average folk. They, they were a couple sets of brothers. Some ran a fishing business. One was a tax collector. Another was an anti-Roman sort of government operative. They were very young, most likely from working class families. They had not known each other. Like they didn't grow up all together as some childhood band of brothers. Jesus selected them, brought them together taught them, modeled what God was like in front of them, performed miracles, told them that he was the Messiah and the Son of, the God, uh, Son of God, sent to save mankind for sin and, and the brokenness of the world, and they believed it. But when he had died, apparently so did their belief. Because on Sunday, they're hiding, and they're fearing for their lives. And if I could, just let's, let's leave them there. For just a moment. And I'll come back to them in a couple minutes. If there's any history enthusiast out there, political history enthusiast particularly, you probably know that the 37th president of the United States, Richard Nixon, was impeached in 1974 for being part of a criminal cover-up called Watergate. It was the break-in of the Democratic National Committee's headquarters in the Watergate Hotel in D.C. And if you study this at all, this event, the name Charles Colson, you know, will come to mind as very prevalent in this. Charles Colson, he served as special counsel to, to Richard Nixon. He, he was known as Nixon's most ruthless advisor, his hatchet man, the, the president's sort of go-to consultant. And, and, and Colson actually ended up pleading guilty to obstruction of justice and was the first member of that administration to be imprisoned for the Watergate scandal. And just before his imprisonment, it says that a friend gave him a book called Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis. And he read it and he gave his life to Jesus at the age of 42. And after his release, you might not know this, that Colson founded Prison Fellowship, which has become the world's largest Christian ministry outreach to prisoners and ex-prisoners. Now, I'm not going to dig deep into, like, Watergate here, okay? But super, super briefly, in March of 1973, before all the facts 
of Watergate were known and came public, it became clear to President Richard Nixon's closest aides that they needed to cover up the Watergate break-in. So about a dozen of the most powerful political people in the world got together and created a cover-up, a lie, in order to save the president his presidency. The name John Dean might ring a bell. John Dean was the first to crack. He went to the prosecutors and offered to testify against the president to save his own skin. And within days, each of the rest of these folks scattered and was trying to protect himself. Powerful men with careers and influence and money at stake, and they could not maintain a lie for three weeks. Back to the first Easter Sunday in the upper room where Jesus' disciples are huddled behind locked doors fearing for their lives. Within days, like within days of this moment, these same men would testify to anyone and everyone out in the streets that they had seen Jesus raised from the dead and testify that he was indeed the Son of God. And those claims would cause them to be hated and detested by their own families. Those claims caused them to be beaten and tortured, imprisoned, and all but one of them died a violent death, martyred for testifying that they indeed see Jesus risen from the dead, and he was indeed the Messiah, the Son of God. Not one single one of them ever once renounced it or denied it after they said it. You would think that if it wasn't true, that one of them would have cracked. Maybe as if they were, as if they were facing execution. Watergate involved the 12 of the most powerful men in the world, and they couldn't keep a lie for three weeks. And you're telling me that these followers of Jesus kept a lie all those years? I think it's an impossible conspiracy. How could they have done that? How could they have faced what they faced if it wasn't true? Because see, see in that room, it says on that evening of that first day of the week, the doors were locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews. And here it is. Jesus came and stood among them. And he said to them, peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. Why didn't they crack? Because they came face to face with the living God. See, I believe people will give their lives for what they know to be true. But I don't believe people will give their lives to what they know is a lie. Charles Colson, he's quoted as saying this, 12 of the most powerful men in America could not keep a lie. And 12 powerless men 2,000 years ago couldn't have been telling anything but the truth. Folks, you know there's four, about 400 prophetic texts in the Old Testament that reference directly or suggest the coming of a Messiah. And operating under a microscope, Jesus fulfilled them all. From his birthplace, which was recorded in Micah chapter 5, to his death on a cross, which is foreshadowed in Psalm 22. Jesus' entire life story is unfolded by people that wrote 700 to 1,000 years before he was ever born. And in one eyewitness account, the Gospel of Matthew alone, it records 65 of these prophecies that were fulfilled in where Jesus was born, what he said, what he did, how he died. I read these, these scriptures earlier. I'm just going to put them back up there for you. Matthew's detailing the, the moments of Jesus' crucifixion. It says that when they had mocked him, they stripped him of his robe, and they put his clothes on him and led him away to crucify him. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads. And then the religious leaders said, hey, saved others. He cannot save himself. 
He's the king of Israel. Let him come down from that cross. Then we'll believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now. If he desires him, for he said, I'm the son of God. And 700 years before this event, the author of Psalm 22 describes what the coming Messiah would endure and what would be said about him at his death. In Psalm 22, verses 7 and 8, it says this, All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. It's the exact same language. He, he trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him. He does so he like delights in him. Man, I don't know how to begin to disprove the, 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 the validity of even one of these prophecies, let alone 400. Like, I don't know how the disciples or some group of their associates at the time of Jesus' death could get together and cross-reference all these ancient sort of prophecies, prophetic verses, and somehow attach a quote to Jesus or an event in his life. I've just, I've spent the last six months reading each of these prophetic verses. I, I got two books, you know, that I've been digging into that I would recommend. One's called The Forgotten Jesus by Robbie Gallaty, and the second one is called Celebrating Jesus in the Biblical Feast by Richard Booker. They aren't exactly page turners, I'm just going to tell you that. They're, they're thinking books, provoking. Um, you know, next week, Pastor Ken, he's going to reveal how these ancient biblical feasts, again, that God established, 700,000 years before Jesus, how they all point to Jesus. On, on Palm Sunday, I'm going to conclude this series, and I'm going to look at Jesus' entrance into Jerusalem on that Palm Sunday, which again fulfills more of this prophecy over who he was. But more importantly on that week, I'm going to be challenging us all to make a decision as to who you think he is. You know, one day or earlier in Jesus' ministry, the disciples come to him. And they're wondering what's next. That They're looking to understand Jesus more, but they're also looking for more meaning and more purpose. And Jesus, he says this quote that might be familiar to a lot of you that, that, that grew up around the church. This is what he says to them. He says to his disciples, I am the way and the truth and the life. And I don't know about you, but I believe all of us are wired sort of a bit for that, like what's next, right? Like, like I, don't want, I, want, I need to search for some more meaning, right? Some more purpose, some more, some more fulfillment, some more, more life. I think all of us are, are, are wired that way. And whether we realize it or not, we have all chosen a way that we are going about pursuing that. Pursuing more life or more meaning or more... We've all chosen a way. We are pursuing some way, all of us, to obtain more life. More purpose or more meaning or more fulfillment. And maybe your way is money. And you are going after all that you can make. Because that is your way to a bigger and more significant life. Maybe your way is beauty. And you're pursuing gym memberships and crazy diets and Botox or expensive clothes. Because that's the way that you find more fulfillment. Maybe your way is family. And everything revolves around your children. Maybe your way is relationships or, or friendships. Maybe your way to more purpose or meaning is your career. Maybe your way to more purpose or, or meaning is the pursuit of knowledge. It's academics. It's, it's more degrees. Folks, we all have a way or ways that we are placing our trust and our time in in order to provide more purpose, and more meaning, and more life. And what's yours? And if you've got maybe something in your mind, just can I ask you three questions about your way? And the first one is this. What does your way promise you? Money and beauty and academics, like they make some pretty big promises. However, at least for me, when I've talked to people that have spent their life pursuing them, they often tell me about looking back and realizing they were all empty promises. Jesus said he is the way. And his promises are greater things. They are second chances. They are a full life. They are eternity. He never promises easy. But he promises best. Second question, how does your way change you? See, your way 
it's changing you. You might not realize it. And a lot of times it's not changing you for the good. Your career pursuit or your pursuit of focusing everything on your kids, it will change you. Jesus has changed me. When he got a hold of my life, he unlocked something inside of me that my kids or my job never could. Jesus said he was the way, and his way leads to transformation and restoration. The third question is, where is your way taking you? Jesus has taken me on an adventure. Jesus said, go. Go to the ends of the earth and have an adventure. Go. And my way has taken me, my way following Jesus has taken me to unforeseen places. And folks, I just got to tell you, I found that, that a lot of other ways out there, they, they take us to comparisonitis. And I just made that word up. And um, what I mean by that is your way taking you to adventure or is your way taking you to comparing what you're doing to others? Or how you're doing compared to last year? Or comparing yourself to your parents' thoughts of what you would do? See, here's the fact, I'm just going to say it. Your way will wear you out. And with that said, though, I really want to make something clear. If somebody said that the Jesus' way is easy, it's, it's not. If they told you that, it's not, it's not true. And Jesus said this, he said, enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many, for the gate is narrow and the way is hard, his way, that leads to life. And those who find it are few. Jesus is saying, wide is the path of those other ways. And a lot of people will choose them. And Jesus is saying that his way is hard. Because most people, they'd rather just be attenders and not surrenderers. They'd rather be takers and not givers. They'd rather stand on the outside and be critics instead of contributors. Folks, the greatest things that God has done and will ever do is through people. People that choose His way. The, the, the narrow path. I know this might sound blunt, but man, I just want to encourage some of you, get off of that wide road path that's filled with nice philosophies. And get onto the road that, that's God's redemptive plan. Folks, all of human history pointed to the coming of Jesus Christ, his life and his death and resurrection. Can I just encourage some of you, stop clinging to an impossible conspiracy and instead choose this incredible way. That's where we're headed leading up to Easter. And the heart of this series is this. Do you believe the resurrection happened? Because I got to just tell you, there's no sense showing up on Easter in your nice little outfit and playing pretend and calling yourself a Christ follower if you don't believe in the resurrection. Jesus' life, his death, and his resurrection leads to that narrow path. This will be a tough series. We're going we're gonna to press in just a bit and really challenge our, our thinking on this and really challenge you all to be really assertive in what it is that you believe. So will you stand up with me across all of our locations? Let me pray. Father God, we just... We open up our hearts to you. Would you, would you challenge our doubts? Or would you, uh, would you reveal something new to us? God, you, would you help us understand the implications of your death and resurrection? And how because of that, we can put our trust in you. 
and follow your way. In your son's name, amen.